Welcome to Globe Midwest Earth System Science Student Research Symposium 2022. Okay, Mike. Thank you, Janet. Um, and thanks to all the schools and students that are participating um, in our symposium. So we're gonna be first starting off um, with presentations from students at Defiance Elementary School with teacher Julie Houck. And I'm sorry, um, this is our another introduction slide. Okay, Julie is presenting live and um, let's see if, okay, Julie, uh, let's see if you start talking, if you'll be full screen. Yeah, I'm here. I just need to be able to share my screen. It still says your screen sharing. Oh, thank you. No problem. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you able to share? Yes. There you go. Yep. All right. We have Levi Slaughter here with his group sharing about water. Focus on water, Mrs. Houck's class. Water is important. Nearly 97 of water of the world's water is salty or otherwise undrinkable. Only 3% of water on Earth is fresh water. Our oceans cover more than 70% of Earth's surfaces. The water is composed of two elements hydrogen and oxygen. Pictures of us testing water. Dissolved, dissolved oxy, oxygen. Mm -hmm. Flowing water. Um, our class went on a field trip to potting soil and water, and we got to test the water, and we tried to filter out the bad stuff in the water, and it was really fun. Potting soil and water trip. Measuring rainwater. We set this rain gauge outside our classroom and continually monitored the amount of precipitation. 60 to 70 percent of our body is water. We need to drink about two liters of water a day to stay healthy. Water facts. Water can be key to finding life. Most fresh water is in ice and, and a lot can live in one drop of water. There are two kinds of water, salt water and fresh water. All water on earth has been recycled. Pictures of flowing water. Flowing Water can be fast or slow. Fun facts. Water helps re regulate the Earth's temperature. H2O is less dense as a solid than as a liquid. Thank you for your time. So Julie, I'm gonna uh, stop share and then share the next slide while comments from the judges are being done, okay? Okay. 
Thank, thank you, Levi. That was wonderful. Your uh, PowerPoint presentation was a beautiful combination of exciting animations of water in action, your class analyzing water samples, and all the fun facts about the importance of water. Um, I really thought it was very, very nicely assembled. And I could say when I was your age, I had no idea what dissolved oxygen was, so I'm impressed. Um, with such an early start to GLOBE in the third grade, I can only imagine all the amazing discoveries you're going to make over the years to come. So nice work. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Okay, Julie, you can introduce and then I'll switch. Yep. I have Ryan Van Ost here and Addison Elston. Yeah. Over here. He measured uh, grass and the blacktop. The air isn't just gas. The air is important to living things like us. Air Celsius and Fahrenheit. Okay, and so you just measured the air temperature? Yes. All right. And I just did the Celsius. Okay. Air Celsius and Both carbon, huh? carbon dioxide is the air is is good and both bad. The tornado E five F five is dangerous to people. I like the thermometer group because we get to thermometer uh, stuff, like the air and like the blacktop and the grass. Here's me. Crazy weather. This is a chart of how bad the weather was this day. A heat wave is an extreme hot temp that can be 115 degrees. If it is 115 degrees, it, it, it is dangerous. And other... Oh, bad weather. So something this group really enjoyed was learning about the temperature changes and how it affects the weather. And we really enjoyed having um, Dr. C share with our class and that kind of got the conversation started with that. That's all. Good job, guys. You stay here, they're gonna tell you your comments. Was that the end of the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Addison. Um, it was great to see your class working with your infrared thermometers to study surface temperature variations. And you'll find that during a heat wave, you'll be amazed on how high those temperatures can get on concrete or asphalt, for example. Um, I thought in your PowerPoint, your photos were pretty exciting. Um, yours back, I used to be a storm chaser back when I was in school and in, uh, in University of Albany. And I've always been impressed with severe weather. So it was exciting to see them. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, Julie, you want to introduce? Yes. This is Aubrey Price Hall. I'm just pulling up my screen for the next one. And she is presenting on clouds and trees. Can you see that okay? Yes. All right. Clouds and trees, this is how class. Can you find all six clouds? 
trees have died were replaced around our school. And we had a lot of trees that had died over the last year or so. And so we were able to replace those trees and plant along where those, the parents um, dropped the kids off at our school. Our class measuring trees. So like that's our class um, measuring the tree basically in winter last year. We're like looking at a chart of clouds. Um, and we are learning about clouds like with the chart in our hand outside. Yeah, putting it in this globe. And then our class is looking at clouds, observing them. I like observing the clouds and going outside and learning the names of cumulus. Was that your favorite type of cloud that you learned about? Cumulus yeah. clouds? Yeah, I like cumulus. We were outside today too. Do you remember what it was today? Cumulus stratus. Today was stratus that we saw. We participated in a cloud hunter stand campaign. Campaign. Three students from Defiance Elementary had their photos selected and showcased. Showcased. We were the only school to participate in the USA. Yep, and this was um, a STEM campaign, and uh, we partnered with a school in Croatia that we had been talking with all year. And so Aubrey's picture and then two other students were selected and displayed in this link here. And um, it was pretty neat that they were um, identified and honored there. Hope you enjoyed our slides. <laughs> Did you find all six of the clouds that they put throughout the slides? I don't think I caught them all, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> there. Th thank you, Aubrey, that was very nice. Uh, thank you for sharing your exciting study of both clouds and trees. Um, I noticed on slide five, you had a picture of this really massive tree. I was really impressed with the size of that tree. You know? And um, I was hoping to, to hear a little bit more about what aspects of trees we were studying. And I was glad to see that you guys were learning to use the cloud charts. Um, in my own research, I do some work related to how trees affect the weather. And you find because of the, the color of the tree or the albedo, or because of evaporation from the tree or the roughness of the tree affecting wind that it can actually have a pretty large effect on the weather, which is pretty cool. But thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the Defiance students and thank you, Julie. Uh, next, we're going to have projects by North Star Montessori Academy with teacher Becky Cookman. And can you see the slide? No. Okay. Who was sharing last? Was it you, Janet, or was it Julie who was sharing last? Um, I was the. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let me know if the video's playing. Can't hear no, we, can't, we can't see the video. Okay. Uh, Janet, we have the wrong uh, presentation. I'm seeing the Crestwood High School presentation. Oh, that's the, right. Uh, Excuse me. 
Sure. Um, yes. What happened is when I clicked, it moved forward and let's start this again. Okay, let's try the video and let's see if that works. And I might have to. We see the video. Okay, let's see if we can get sound now. Can you hear it? No. No. When you when you do share, you have to click on share sound. It's like in the lower left, I think. And did you do that? Mm. So I would suggest stop sharing. And then go to share again, and then you have to click on a button that says uh, share sound. Okay. Under audio settings? No, it's right on the share. So when you, you click on share screen, it's um, on the lower left corner is share sound. Before you click on the um, the pane that you want to share, can you see it, Kevin? I don't see it on the. No. Oh, I finally it came up. Share sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The title of our project is Influence Great. of Lose Track Board Color on Ice Quality. And you can see it. The purpose of our project yeah, is to enough. determine if the wall color of the boards on the side of the track influences the quality of the mm -hmm. ice and how long it lasts. This fall, we experienced Perfect. with an Aaron Rover and found that heat seemed to be attracted to the black pavement because it was hot, hotter than the light colored sidewalk. We then tested the idea that darker colors attract heat and lighter colors we selected away. We took pieces of cardboard and painted them different colors. We let them dry and then put them in the sun for an hour. Next, we used a handheld infrared thermometer to check the temperature of each piece of painted cardboard. We found that the lighter colors were colder than the darker colors. Two of our classmates are members of the Upper Peninsula Luge Club. They, pra they practice at Lucy Hill in Nagani, Michigan. Lucy Hill is the only ice natural track luge hill in North America. The UP Luge Club asks, asked our class if there is anything that can be done to keep our, the ice on the track longer. Members of the club showed us pictures of the ice next to the side wall or boards. From the previous years, we noticed that the boards of the luge track are dark, a dark brown color. During the beginning and middle of the luge season, the ice is right up against the boards. And in March, there was a gap between the ice and the wall. It's close to it's like the ice was being pulled away from the boards, but it probably is just melting close to the board. We thought if the boards were a different color, maybe the ice wouldn't pull away so the ice would last longer. 
In the fall, our class went to Lucy Hill to paint the loose tracks board. Some were painted light colors, and others were left unpainted. Then we waited. In March, we went back to Lucy Hill to take measurements of ice quality and temperatures of the boards within IRT three different times within 10 days. We followed air temperature and surface temperature protocols. We numbered the segments of boards from the bottom up. The odd numbered boards were painted and the even numbered boards were unpainted. To rate, rate ice quality, we measured the temperature of each sidewalk board segment, air temperature, and how far away the ice was pulled away was pulled away from the board. We found out that the colors, the color of the board matters. This graph shows the data we collected. The unnumbered board segments, the ones we painted, have a smaller distance between the board and the top of the ice surface than the wall gap than the even numbered boards. This means that we were that the boards we painted had less melting than the boards that and those that were on painted. This makes sense because in our reading we found that darker colors absorb heat and lighter colors reflect heat. So the darker colors of, un of the unpainted boards will cause the board to heat up, which causes the ice to melt faster. Light colors reflect heat, so the boards wouldn't heat up as fast, so the ice melts slower. We suggest that the Upper Peninsula Luge Club put some lighter board colors on the boards. That way the ice won't melt so, so that the ice won't melt that fast. Or replace the brown boards with lighter colored boards. Perhaps use acacia or oak boards. We had some problems collecting and recording data. When we when we went to Lucy Hill in the fall, we tried to use the Aaron rover to take some measurements, but the rover wouldn't go up the hill. The rover was just slipping and getting stuck in the grass. Next year, we could put the rover in on a sled going down a luge hill instead of going up. It could work in the fall and the winter. We also had a problem with data collection, and one of our March visits, the handheld IRT didn't work, so we just took distance measurements. The weather warmed up really quickly in March. By the time of our visit, the ice was melted so much that sometimes it was hard to tell where to take distance measurements. We appreciated doing this research for GLOBE and NASA because it was really fun and we were able to help the Luge Club. Thank you, class. Um, I would never have thought of using Globe to improve Luge. What an amazingly creative idea. Um, I've never tried Luge, but it looks super fun. Uh, nice use of the uh, Terra Rover and the infrared thermometers to demonstrate the impact of surface albedo or reflectivity and ice melt rates. Your recommendation to the Luge Club is highly applicable and valuable. Great work. Um, I was curious also how large of a temperature difference you found among the different color cardboard squares. Uh, Becky, are the students able to answer the question? Yeah. Yes, they are. Let me, I don't know that that was a long time ago. Do you guys remember? There was quite a bit big difference. I don't recall. Patrick, you have all that data. Do you remember? But we don't have the data right off, off the hand. That's okay. Thank you. Very nice. Um, I'll jump in just for a second. I find the physics of the whole thing amazing that there's no plastic underneath the ice. Uh, I make an ice rink every year in my backyard, and the plastic's very important to keep the water in the ice rink. So this is quite something.
Thank you. Hey, Janet. Yes. We're uh, a little bit uh, ahead of schedule right now, and I didn't know if uh, if you wanted to continue uh, or should we maybe take a little pause for a second and talk about the Midwest uh, Symposium while we're doing it, get back on schedule. I didn't know how important it was to uh, remain on schedule in case students were going to be attending with us. Uh, I know Diana Johns' students were logged in. Um, David, go right ahead. Do you want okay. me to, I'll just keep this slide up. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just uh, just talk a little bit uh, and, and for the sake of everybody who's listening, uh, because we are on a schedule and some students are able to uh, attend at certain times, but not at other times, we wanna make sure that they have the, uh, the ability to, uh, to listen in and, and to respond to questions. Um, but since I have the time, my name is Dave Bidlowski and um, my job, I work with Wayne Risa, which is the Regional Educational Service Agency in Wayne County, Michigan. And I'm also a co-investigator on the ARIN project, the NASA funded ARIN project. And I was really excited to watch the, uh, the North Star Montessori Academy presentation that, uh, that included a, a, a terror rover. And I was not aware of that. And I have a meeting this afternoon with the rest of the ARIN project team and I'll certainly be sending out your presentation so that everybody who's involved in the team across the United States, as well as NASA, gets the opportunity to see the work that you did with the Terra Rover. And I certainly understand the problems that you had uh, taking it up the hill there. Uh, also, uh, we're going to be doing a training next week on the Terra Rover and, and Mike, uh, Notaro, who was just talking to you, is going to be participating in that as well. And so we have 40 teachers from across the United States. And I know that uh, they would be very interested to see the work that you've done, especially uh, in elementary school at the Montessori school. I, I think you set a really perfect example for how you can use some of these uh, technologies uh, with teachers. You're going to be, I hope the kids from uh, North Star Academy can watch the presentations coming up from Crestwood High School. Crestwood High School has uh, two projects that integrate the Terra Rover into it. And um, Crestwood High School, under the, the teaching of uh, Dr. Diana Johns, has uh, been involved in the GLOBE program for many, many years. And some of the student presentations that you're gonna be able to uh, view are really outstanding. And one in particular is going to be able to be shared at the Globe Annual Conference uh, taking place, I think in July of this year. So uh, I think it's, a, it's really nice to see the work that came from North Star and then compare it to the work at, uh, at Crestwood. And I think teachers can really see this evolution. So my compliments again, North Star Montessori, uh, for their project and their work with the Terra Rover. And so what I would like to do now is introduce uh, our first project from Crestwood High School. And unfortunately, the students had an exam today for our first project. And the first project is entitled um, Assessing Variations in Nitrate and Dissolved Oxygen Concentrations Along Southeast Michigan's Rouge. And the students that are involved in the presentation are Ali Ayub, Ali Haydar, Soher Holman, Mohammed Rahal, and Nader Sharif. So Janet, if you'd like to call up that presentation, uh, it'd be great to see that. Okay. And once again, as you call that up, those students had exams today. Probably nobody will be available afterwards, but um, welcome to have any comments that, that folks might have. Hello, everyone. 
Can Janet? you hear it? Well, it's, it's no. not sharing. Okay. Yeah, I hear my name. I <laughs> hear <know>. myself talking. <laughs> hey, while all, we're talking, all the, though, all the YouTube. For, <laughs> while, we're waiting, while we're waiting for uh, for Crestwood, I did another comment about that luge project. I was just so amazed by that. I'd never seen a luge track in my life. And to compare that luge track with what we see on television in the Olympics, the high tech, everything on the loose track, and to watch what it's really like in the real world, it was amazing to watch that one. So that was great. Oh, Janet's calling that up too. I, I see the students from Crestwood High School are there. Always, a, I know that classroom very well. Wonderful students that are there and hello to you. Are any of you in the first project, by the way, that I'm looking at that we're gonna take that biology test today? Um, no, they're okay. all on other test. Okay, just wanted to check. Uh, I'm having technical difficulties here because all of a sudden it said, oh, we want to restart your computer here. Well, that's fun. <laughs> and you probably can't see this. Not yet. But we all understand the technical issues, that's for sure. Okay. I don't even see Zoom anymore. But I'm, oh, here it is. It's buried. Janet, I might be able to share. It'd be easier. Um, oh, there you are. There you go. I'll get the hang of it by the time we're done. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm John Moore. Oh, wow. Did that Thomas. come up? Oh my Being a globe blogger was an incredible experience and I learned a lot Okay, now I don't know how I got where I'm at You, you hit the fast forward button versus the play button, I think Okay you Jump to the next uh, Video Video, yeah Okay um, we're going to do this. Uh, this project is which one for, are we talking? This is nitrate uh, assessment. The River Rouge, in, right? The River Rouge? Well, a couple of them deal with it, but yes, that's the River Rouge too. Assessing uh, variations in nitrate. Yeah. Right, okay. that's the name of it. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to play it from my computer. Well, one good thing is we're getting much closer to being on schedule again. So there's always <laughs> positives in there. Yes. Okay. Now, there can you, you see That's that? A, now I'm yeah, going to play the you. video from my computer, and I'll do that with the other ones that I have. Hello, everyone. This is a presentation on assessing variations in nitrate and dissolved oxygen concentrations along the southeast Michigan's Rouge River. 
Our research sprouted from our previous colleagues who done, who've done research on one location, Ford Field. This year, we studied four, Ford Field, Vinoy Road, Sheldon Road, and Ridge Road. All sampling sites were located within the lower branch of the Rouge River, where we analyzed the dissolved oxygen and nitrate levels at each site. The reason for our research is in the last 20 years, there have been many findings regarding nitrate levels in rivers and how they affect the surrounding ecosystems. Our null hypothesis was there is no discernible differences between nitrate levels measured at each branch of the Rouge River. Our methodology began as we researched different sites and seen if they were accessible to our research. In the next photo, you'll see our materials being properly covered as we had to keep them away from water. In the next one, you'll see a group of us. And here, after sampling the, after getting the water, we brought it back to our lab and observed the dissolved oxygen as well as the nitrate levels using the Hatch DR1900. At our site, we observed the air temperature and the water temperature and collected the data for further sampling. Here, you'll see a student researcher implementing our data into the GLOBE website. We made graphs um, based on elevation versus nitrates, water temperature versus nitrates, dissolved oxygen versus nitrates, site elevation, water temperature, and DO. It was really originally intended that we collect a test of fecal coliform. However, after collecting and analyzing the samples, the data was lost. Without the data from fecal coliform, our group was still able to present accurate data. We found that the nitrate levels weren't as high as they were anticipated to be. The reason we thought there was an issue was because we believed that there was sewage being implemented into the river, causing high nitrate levels. As our research proves a year later that there has been improvement on our sewage system and the outdated retention basis. A way we can improve nitrate levels being high in the Rouge River would be rain gardens. Limiting the amount of polluted water that goes into the Rouge will help with the nitrate levels and the rain gardens are a beautiful thing for the community. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you for that presentation. And, and again, our uh, our presenters are not available today, but I did have some comments and, and Mike and Janet and Kevin, please feel free to, to share any comments that you might have afterwards. I, uh, I really uh, enjoyed that they uh, cited four locations. They had four study sites along uh, the lower route. Didn't just stick to one area. I thought that was very good. I uh, also want to compliment the uh, the presentation itself. It was very clear. So very often the sound can be difficult uh, to transmit. And uh, I think you really used a nice, uh, good technology to make sure that everything was nice and clear and very easy to understand for everyone. Um, I like uh, I like how you do your your methodology slide. It's nice to have those photos there, and you'll probably hear me talk about this again on the other presentations. It's really nice if I could have a photo and a couple of words to to follow what was taking place. It's a really nice method. Um, I also like the testing tool. Some of your tools um, are a little high end, expect, especially for uh, for nitrates using the spectral photometer. But boy, you get very, very good results. And I know that Crestwood High School often supports the work of other schools by using some of your equipment to share with others. And that's wonderful. Um, the graphs that were presented were very clear and very easy to understand. I thought it was interesting uh, and unfortunate not to have the fecal coliform data because uh, that would have been very good. But I certainly understand the problem that can happen in trying to collect data on fecal coliform and the various things that can go wrong. And because it, it was really getting at that idea that sewage does affect nitrates and to draw that correlation, I thought that was very good. And uh, another time around that uh, maybe that data can be collected. Um, and then in particular, I really liked how uh, the connection back to the community. And again, you may hear me say that in other projects of uh, why this is meaningful and what can be done and the idea of of showing how rain gardens can be a solution to the problem of nitrates um, in the uh, in that situation and, and the data that can be collected. Um, so, so with that, it was a very good project. I don't know if Mike or Kevin or Janet, if you have anything that you would like to share. 
Yeah, I can add some. Um, first of all, it was, it was a great presentation. Um, I thought it would be nice to give a little bit of thought about the uh, sources of the nitrates. So for example, maybe exploring daily precipitation intensity and seeing how heavy precipitation events might be contributing to the nitrate levels. And that's often, for example, in an agricultural region that might occur where the nitrates are transported into the river. Um, the poster itself are, it reminds me when I go each year to the American Geophysical Union Conference, um, the, the quality of the poster you presented is pretty comparable to that. And that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. I mean, it's real nice. You did a really great job with it. Thank you. Okay, so we're getting pretty close to the schedule. So I'll move on and, and thank the students for the first presentation. Our second presentation, also from Prestwood High School uh, in Dearborn Heights uh, with teacher Diana Johns is, is entitled, an analysis of crayfish populations in the Rouge River compared with select water quality parameters. And our, our presenters are Samar Ayash, um, and Razan Shams and Mohammed Harp. So with that, we can go to that presentation. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties. All right, if we're on uh, if we're on participants, so we can see the nice students from Crestwood High School anyway. So <laughs> good to see them. Welcome. I am trying. I've got the video up. Oh, here we go. Finally, it clicked. Here we go. It's not on our screen, Janet. Do you think it's on? No. Okay. Very good. Now, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So let's get it started. Through the months of September and October of 2021, our group completed a seven week field study of monitoring crayfish populations in correspondence with water quality conditions in the Middle and Lower Rouge. We decided to do this research because of many reasons. First of all, crayfish are a keystone species and play an integral part in keeping food web stable. We were also interested to see which water quality conditions would influence crayfish populations. And we wanted to discover whether invasive species of crayfish would be present. These are our null hypotheses and research questions. Our research methods included using cylindrical minnow traps we made out of wire and using cat food as bait. The traps were left in the two locations overnight and retrieved the next day. Testing for dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and temperature were done the day the traps were set. Now we'd like to share our results. In the middle branch of the rouge, we caught 11 crayfish, seven of which were female, and the only species identified were virile crayfish. The size of these crayfish varied from 8.5 to 12.7 centimeters. When compared to water quality results, there was a negative correlation between air and water temperature with crayfish populations, and there was little correlation between turbidity and DO with crayfish populations. While on the lower branch of the Rouge River, our team caught eight crayfish, five of which were female, and the only species identified again were virile crayfish. The lengths of these crayfish vary from 6 to 10 centimeters. When comparing to water quality results, 
there was a strong negative correlation between air and water temperature in crayfish populations. And there was a slight negative correlation between turbidity and crayfish populations, and a slight positive correlation between DO and crayfish populations. The data notes key differences in our sites. Ones that were noted were, the lower ooze correlated more with our water quality conditions, the size of the crayfish were larger in the middle rouge, and the distribution in the amount of crayfish caught was seen in the middle rouge more than the lower rouge. Although our findings are fascinating, we need to keep our focus on the bigger picture. As society continues to develop, we need to do our part in monitoring how these different parameters affect our local habitats and the critters that reside within them. Thank you. Well, thank you for that great presentation. I'll go through a few comments, but then we'd love to hear from the students at, at Crestwood on your thoughts. Um, just, a, uh, just kind of a review that this took place in, uh, in September and October of last year. And I like how you brought up the idea that crayfish are a keystone population in the Rouge. And uh, I like the idea of, of saying, what, what are the things that impacts this keystone population and also bringing in this idea of an invasive species of crayfish, because I don't think people are aware of that. Um, I like that you looked at uh, the factors of dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and temperature, and looked at those correlations uh, to crayfish populations. Again, your methodology slide, I always like, it's very, very clear, very easy to understand. And on a personal note, I remember, um, and I, I remember talking to Dr. Johns about it, the idea that I was playing golf one day and they were studying crayfish at the golf course that I was uh, uh, playing golf at. I had the opportunity to, to talk to the university people and then to see the work being done at a high school level, it's just phenomenal. Um, also a comment about the size, that was, that's something. And, and there again, uh, you look at that big picture, what is it that's impacting this keystone population? I wonder if you have any thoughts about any of those or if you'd just like to comment about the work that you did on this project. I think it's a really interesting biology uh, uh, research project. Um, well, we think mainly it's uh, turbidity and just the things that we studied that would impact crayfish populations. We saw a trend where as temperature increased and as fall progressed, there tended to be like more crayfish every time we went out to catch them. So the biggest thing is temperature right now. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Do either of you want to talk about uh, catching the crayfish from a personal note? That's a task. Uh, yeah, it was very fun. Um, we just set out traps and put um, a can of cat food inside. And then after a day, we'd come back and then see what we got. They're very uh, fun to deal with. You have to like uh, try to like get get a pair of gloves and then try and grab them by their backs. And then uh, it's very difficult to measure them out because you start clawing at the ruler, or whatever the tape measure you're using to measure them. And uh, sometimes they claw your arm, but you know, it's pretty fun. <laughs> Did any of you develop a taste for crawdads while you were doing this at all? <laughs> no, we haven't tried it. <laughs> okay. Um, but we named some, but uh, that's a lot we did. <laughs> Well, I wanna thank all of you for that wonderful project and our congratulations for continued great work over at Crestwood High School. My best for all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, our next project from Crestwood High School is entitled Use of a Terra Rover 2 to Collect Fine Particle Matter Using Arduino Related Technology. And this was one in particular that I was referencing back to our, our friends at, um, um, North Star Montessori Academy. You'll see how students at a high school level are using these same tools that you used. And I think it was really wonderful. And our presenters for this project are Maher Harp and uh, Hala, Hala Komaya. So, or Komeya, I'm sorry, Komeya. So thank you very much. Okay. And our students, while we're waiting for your video to come up, you feel free to wave and say hi to us there. So there you are. Very good. Outstanding students there. And again, uh, their teacher is Dr. Diana Johns, who has uh, been a GLOBE teacher for a long time and just is a, a role model for everyone in our project and in the GLOBE program, as well as 
uh, education in Michigan. Yeah, that's perfect, Janet. Thank you. Hello, our names are Maher Harman and Hala Kumeha, and we are from Crestwood High School. Our GLOW project was about the use of a Terra over 2 to collect fine particle matter using Arduino-related technology. For our research, we modified a NASA Terra over 2 to sense fine particles using a particular matter 2.5 air quality sensor. The sensor was programmed using Arduino programming and wired to an Arduino Leonardo. Numerous trials with the mobilized air quality sensor were made detecting particulate sizes in multiple places around Crestwood High School. Analyzing ground level particulate matter concentrations is crucial as it is a factor to the development of respiratory diseases and, more in context, can give insight to the school if human interaction is permissible. We found out that particulate matter concentration levels moderately vary in our different sites. Weather changes, the time the data was gathered, the accuracy of the particulate matter sensor while driving on the Terra Rover 2, and the altitude of the particulate matter sensor are all possible sources of error. We also measured wind speed, humidity, and temperature of the testing site using GLOBE protocols. But upon analysis of the data, there appeared to be no correlation between any of those parameters and particulate matter. We accepted our first null hypothesis, as there are little difference in particulate matter levels in different locations. We rejected our second and third null hypotheses, as there are more particles less than 2.5 microns at Beach Lake Road than any other site, and the Terra River 2 was successful to drive outdoors. For our methodology, we began the research by mapping out the locations we wanted our data to be pulled from. As you can see in the first picture, we chose five areas that all surrounded a suburban high school campus. Next, we coded our particulate matter sensor using C++ dialect. This allowed the sensor to measure particulate matter levels of six different particle sizes, ranging from 0.3 microns to 10 microns. Following that, we connected the Arduino Leonardo microcontroller board to the particulate matter sensor and secured both of them to the Terra Rover 2. We then drove the Terra Rover in all five designated areas as the particulate matter levels were getting automatically sent to a laptop. Finally, we analyzed, averaged, and exported the data into a Google spreadsheet. The data was organized by location, particle size, and trial. Beach Lake Road has the largest collection of particles greater than 0.3 microns as it has contacts with vehicle exhaust and other factors around the concepts of wind direction and wind speed. Giving more information about this area can alarm Crestwood School Board and city politicians for a remodel. For particles greater than 0.5 and 1 microns, you can see a drastic change in the student parking lot site. Particles greater than 2.5, 5, and 10 microns, we see the banned practice field in the student parking lot, having well over the largest concentrations. In conclusion, research on particulate matter is extremely imperative nowadays, because while most particulate matter is filtered mechanically by our nose and upper respiratory passageways, finer particles are able to travel further in our lungs and may even get into our bloodstream. Because of COVID-19's effect on our upper respiratory system, these ultrafine particles will be even more detrimental to human health, possibly increasing mortality due to their numerous negative health effects on our heart and our lungs. As we expand this research, we plan on connecting our radio module to the Arduino, as this will allow the particulate matter sensor to collect and save data wirelessly. We also hope to rebuild the robot by replacing the 3D printed parts with metal and other tough materials. This will allow for a smoother drive across rough surfaces and a more intact platform for the sensors and Arduino. The final advancement that we would like to add is a suite of air quality sensors that will simultaneously run to display other pollutants in the air, such as nitrogen oxides, sulfuric oxides, lead, and other air pollutants. All of these additions will help the Terra Rover more successfully monitor air pollutants in places too dangerous for humans to enter. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. For more information on the research, you can refer back to our research paper on the GLOBE website. Well, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. And uh, obviously on a personal note, because I'm involved in the Aaron project and we've worked on the development of the Terra Rover, just wonderful how you've taken it another level. And I know you just joined us, but I don't know if you had the opportunity to watch the presentation from um, North Star Montessori and see how elementary students were using the Terra Rover. And it leads to the possibility sometime in the future of some partnerships between schools and other states or across the same state, in this case, Upper and Lower Peninsula. So it was wonderful. Uh, really like what you did on the Terra Rover, how you adapted, how you made changes on it. I think you're exactly right about replacing uh, 3D printed uh, materials with uh, metal materials. We're finding the same thing just for the wear and tear that it, ha that it has. Uh, and I, I like how you talked about particle size and, and the impact that it has with uh, human health. I think that's really important that your project is, is really has a connection 
to the health of individuals, and that you looked at factors that maybe didn't have any effect of wind speed and temperature and so on, but that you explored those as well. Obviously, I, I always like your methodology slide. Uh, I like how you collected data from around the school and uh, the particular matter level that you had, and that that you share with the data with the community. It's important to know how these particulates uh, affect our lungs and our, our blood. And um, I think that's really important to make that community connection. And I think that's a real strong part with Crestwood projects. Would either of you like to share some of your thoughts about the project while you have the opportunity? Uh, really just like the process of where we were of like finding out about the air the terror over two and knowing about how we can get, like you said, uh, take it a step further about adding another sensor and using another Arduino lane artery board uh, while uh, self-programming it. It was really like a very good uh, learning experience, uh, just building on our uh, experiences with Arduino programming and using that. And it's really cool how we have a, a real life uh, uh, example of how you can actually use the power of programming to uh, help a community, as you said. And Hala, would you like to have a share a comment? Yeah, um, I'd like to say how it was really cool to just do this project and explore, like he said, with the Arduinos and program those. And then um, in the future, hopefully we can add more sensors um, and learn how to program those too. Um, and also it's really cool to see this project like come to life because it's obviously very important to life nowadays, mostly with COVID constantly affecting our environment around us and the people around us. So measuring this type of stuff, mostly in places where humans aren't viable to enter is a really cool and hopefully can later be used in real life. Yeah, and um, wasn't your, the, is yours the project that was accepted to be presented at the Globe Annual Conference? No, it wasn't ours. No, it's another one coming up there. Maybe the next one, I don't remember which one. Was it Maher, were you the one who just accepted to college? Were you the one? Uh, no, I still have two. That's, not, that's a different one. Okay. Okay. So just checking there. Well, thank you so much. You just had a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it. Can I add one thing then? Sure. Um, I was just amazed. I mean, you, not only did you modify the Rover and add a new sensor for particular matter, you also worked with all the programming on the sensor. I, just, I felt like I was listening to a graduate student. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> nice work. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so our fourth presentation, our final presentation from Crestwood High School is entitled Assessing the Effects of Surface Temperature and Tree Coverage in Select Suburban Parks. And again, it's from Crestwood High School, the teacher, uh, Dr. Diana Johns, and our presenters for this one are Yasmin Abbas, uh, Yamina Abbas, uh, Marwa Idiba, Idivi, I was doing so good there for a while, and Zainab Zaydan. So thank you. And it's nice to see you on the screen there, all of you. Okay, I'm clicking stop share and it's not. Okay. And as you might guess, many of the students at Crestwood High School are in the National Honor Society, as we can see there. That's very nice. Here we go. Hello, my name is Zainab Zaydan. This is Mara Divi, and that's Yasmin Abbas. We're from Crestwood High School in Dearborn Heights, Michigan. Our topic is assessing the effects of surface temperature and tree coverage in select suburban parks. Throughout the months of July through October 2021, we evaluated the effects of surface temperature and tree coverage at two suburban parks in our community, Dearborn Heights, Michigan. We focused on tree height, tree circumference, and their relationship to surface temperature. Ten trees per park were measured, and the highest and lowest surface temperatures were determined. Using the Globe Observer Tree app, we measured the tree height and diameter breast height. A digital infrared thermometer and a Globe Air and Terra Rover were used to measure the surface temp. Along with the surface temp, the Terra Rover determined GPS and air temperature. Overall, the data we collected suggests a clear relationship between tree height, circumference, and surface temperature. The first step was to take measurements of the circumference and diameter breast height of each tree using the Globe Observer app. 
The second step was to determine the surface temperature measurement using an infrared thermometer at each tree. Our third step was to prepare the Terra rover for collecting surface temperature. This involved setting the GPS. The fourth step was to drive the Terra rover around both sites to collect the surface temperature data. The fifth step was to input and analyze our findings from the Terra rover and into the online platform CODEP. Our last step was to input all the data into the GLOBE website. After our data was analyzed and interpreted through CODEP, it was clear that there was a significant difference between the surface temperatures measured in shaded areas compared to the surface temperatures measured in unshaded areas. Furthermore, this difference was only made more significant as the circumference of the trees increased. Through the circumference and tree heights we measured during our research, our data showed that trees with a larger circumference were taller and trees with a smaller circumference were shorter. This connection also correlates to the shaded region of the trees, as trees that were taller and larger had a larger difference between the temperature of the unshaded versus shaded region, and trees that were smaller and shorter had a smaller difference between the temperature of the shaded versus unshaded region. The evidence that tree canopies heavily influence a park grower's experience illuminates the need for increased care for tree maintenance and preservation. The data collected throughout the summer of 2021 showed that the relative heights and circumferences of each tree had a positive correlation with the diameter breast height of each tree, since taller and wider trees cover larger surfaces than smaller and thinner ones. We used an infrared thermometer and noticed a significant difference in temperatures of areas in direct sunlight, such as the tennis courts, versus the areas that had shade coverage, like certain picnic tables under the trees, seen at Site 2. We suggest that park personnel consider placing picnic tables in areas that have shade coverage to attract local residents, since they would have a cooler spot to relax. In order for us to combat climate change, we must plant more native species and avoid planting non-native plants, considering they might be invasive. We as a community should also consider planting more trees so families can enjoy picnics in shaded areas of the park. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. And just a few comments, uh, another great presentation. Um, really enjoyed how you used the Terra Rover. Uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. And as I had mentioned to uh, our friends at North Star, I'll be sharing your project again with our full Aaron project team at, uh, and the NASA folks to uh, see these this presentation with your oral presentation of your project. It's very, very good. Um, like that you studied uh, tree circumference and the relationships that you made. Your methodology slide is always just excellent. Um, I also liked a lot, maybe because it's more of a personal matter, uh, we're doing a, a, a training for teachers coming up on the Terra Rover. And one of the things is how do you uh, share the data that you collected? And I really liked your, your section on how you use CODAP with your data. And, and I'm, not, I'm sure that a lot of people don't really know a lot about that. And I thought it was a really nice example that we can share with uh, teachers in our upcoming workshop as well. I like how you went to the shaded and unshaded areas and how, how you talked about the impact that we need to be taking care of our trees. And I, you know, just a simple thing. I like that comment about putting the picnic tables under trees. It's so often I go around a park and you put the tables right out in the middle of the sun. But I like how you then make that correlation that you're inviting people to come and sit in these tables because they're shaded. It's just, it's very logical, makes it sense. And, and again, as all of your projects, I like the community connection that you go back to. So this is very, very good presentation. Would you, all three of you like to share a couple of thoughts that you had in your, uh, in your research work? Um, basically, like we kind of the kind of inspiration for this whole project was, like you said, our experience with going to the parks and then there's absolutely no no shade under like picnic benches or like where the tennis courts are or just in general where people would be clustered. So then you kind of find ourselves just like grouped together under one like little tiny branch where there is some shade. So that kind of inspired us to you know, just analyze how big of a difference there really is versus the shaded and non-shaded parts. Um, Others? Um, it was really cool also being able to use the Terra Rover because it was definitely a new experience for all three of us. And it was just like a learning process, um, learning how to navigate it. Um, we did unfortunately lose some data, which was a learning like curve for us. And just inputting it all into CODAP was a really cool experience. A last comment? Would you like that? Uh, I really liked like how we 
like looking at the different surface temperatures of the different areas since we like measured um surface temperatures of the black top and the tennis courts and like and even the grass or like the areas around the trees and i just found it like very useful to like look at that information and see the the variety of temperature differences even if like the weather is still the same outside since the surfaces are different thank you and you know we have uh dr c here kevin uh, who is uh kind of the, the person for uh, surface temperature. Kevin, do you have any uh, comments? I know you know um, the work that they're doing. Well, I, you know, I really uh, like that you look at the tree height versus circumference, and I, I didn't know that they would necessarily be related so well. Um, and I thought it was great that so maybe you could just do tree height and then you could figure out the impact of those trees on the shade and the temperature, uh, kind of using uh, surrogates for the the values, you know, the data. So that's a great project. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And Kevin, let me turn it over to you so you can introduce your next groups. Thank you very much. All right, well, the next groups are, um, well, I have to read the, read the right one. Oh, I have to thank Crestwood High School. Thank you. <laughs> we have a little bit of a script here, so. Um, and the following students are from uh, Thurkel Middle School. They made videos. Uh, they won't be here in person, but we're gonna um, have, show their presentation and then I'll make some comments and judges can make some comments about it. Here's our first project from my, my own, my own, my, oh my goodness, Mayana Bell. Good afternoon. My name is Mayana Bell, and my project is which one? So the, the video is not showing, Janet. You can hear it. I think many of these students have presented before, and they've done projects over the years. And Connie Atkinson is the uh, teacher. She supported a lot of uh, students doing water quality projects in the Detroit area. So the, the, their school is from Detroit Public Schools. Uh, they've looked at the River Rouge, similar to um, Crestwood High School students. Janet, how, how are things coming? We're showing the videos. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Mayana Bell, and my project is which water will produce the healthiest raffinus sativa plant. In my project, I planted 30 raffinus sativa seeds in 30 peat pots, one seed for each peat pot. I watered them with tap water, bottled water, and snow melt, which was my control. I chose snow melt as my control because it was untampered by human or animal interaction. In my hypothesis, I said that the snow melt will grow first because it's untampered with, but I was surprised because the tap water grew the fastest, Bo followed by bottled water, and last grew the snow melt. The bottled water was supposed to grow the fastest and the strongest, but it was no different from the snow melt. In conclusion, my data was not enough because I didn't have enough time samples to confirm it. Here shows the first growth for tap water. 
bottled water, and snow melt. This shows today's growth of all the plants. You have bottled water, snow melt, and tap water. This chart shows the first growth in week one of all the plants. And this chart shows how many plants grew the first time. Thank you for tuning in. Mike, you uh, took a look at this project. Yeah, I was going to say you must have spent a lot of time working on this project. Even with that many potted plants, you concluded that even more was needed. And that gives a clue about how much work science can be when you need such a large sample size sometimes. Uh, you presented your work very confidently. Um, I think radishes prefer a slightly acidic to neutral soil with a pH of six to seven. So that probably gave the snow melt somewhat of an advantage. Um, and as a suggestion, keep in mind that precipitation tends to be acidic because of pollution. So uh, even snow melt is not necessarily clean and not necessarily unimpacted by people. Great work. Yeah, my understanding of the radishes were chosen because they grow quickly and sprout quickly. All right. Janet, um, we can look at the next one if you are ready. So Caitlin Brown, again from Thurkle uh, Middle School, Connie Atkinson's the teacher. Atkinson. So I, um, Connie, you know, has told me before, a lot of people say Atkinson, it's Atkinson, no, no N in there. I believe uh, Caitlin is in ninth grade. And this is one of those projects where um, they're collecting water samples from different rivers. I'll have this down pat by the time we're done. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that because, oh. I don't hear anything. Yeah, she's not moving. And while Janet's working on that, um, Diana and the students from Crestwood, did any of you present at AGU this year? I, I think students from Crestwood presented at AGU in the past. I believe some of these students from uh, Thurkle also presented at AGU this year. Yes, that you are correct. Hi, my name is Caitlin Brown and my project is about is there a difference between the urban waters in Michigan? So my hypothesis was about, I thought that um, the um, water will be healthier or like more drinkable if it's a river, but most likely it was kind of not. So we was testing each water to see which one was kind of healthier to see it was a river, but it was kind of hard and it was really fun trying to do this because the water was really froze. So we have to chip parts of the water trip parts of the ice out so we can turn it into water so we'd be able to test it. I had to, it was like kind of a week trying to test each water out each day or whenever I had to because I have to shake the water up before I um, test it first. But it was kind of hard. Another reason why it was kind of hard was because we was virtual at the time. But other than that, it was really fun. And my hypothesis is kind of wrong, but I still kind of agree with my hypothesis, even though it was still wrong. Thanks for watching. 
All right. Now, one of the things, these uh, projects were submitted to the IVSS, I believe, or to the Globe Mission Earth part of the Globe webpage, so they've been uploaded. And so there is a PowerPoint there associated with each of the projects. And I had a chance to look at all the projects. Uh, really nice job everybody did. And um, what, what's interesting, this one, the Ottawa River smelled bad is what Caitlin said. And um, I think, I was wondering if she was talking about an Ottawa River in Michigan, not in Ohio, because of course there's an Ottawa River that passes through the University of Toledo. I'm not sure, it might be that one. And there might be parts of it that smell bad. Um, you know, and she, she mentioned a lot of the challenges that she had with collecting the data. I did um, post a question because when she measured the temperature of the water, she had negative temperatures. And I think what she was measuring was the hard water, right, of the ice. And she mentioned that in her presentation here, how um, <laughs> they had to chop through the ice to uh, collect the water samples. Uh, and then the last thing I, I did want to comment you know, she noted that the turbidity was low uh, and she didn't expect it to be so low, but one of the things is in the winter, uh, you know, everything's frozen, water's not moving so much. So that, that is the time of year when turbidity is the lowest, it tends to be the lowest. So I hope she continues where her project is a great, great, great idea, uh, looking at the different uh, rivers and then comparing them and to see uh, you know, how the water quality could pairs between different river systems. Okay, so then our next, oh, any other comments from any other judges? Then our, our next presentation. Now, did you see that when I switched? I don't, I did not do share screen, hold on. Okay, do you see the presentation slide? Yes. Um, oh, Yanni did we just Craven. do this one? Oh. No, no. Okay. Yeah, several of the students um, from Thurkle did projects on growing uh, radishes, and then other students did the water quality rivers. Um, okay, I've got the video up. Um, okay. I also found find it interesting how every project from the different schools approach the video in a different way. And I find that my refreshing. Name is Craven, and today my project is on do does polluted water affect plant growth of Raphidus sativus. I think that watering Raphidus sativus plants neg negatively affects plant growth because of different waters. Ohio River Silver Creek plants, some of them grew and then after they recently died. But Rouge River is the one that grew the fastest. Detroit didn't grow. And after that, it was Ottawa River. That one didn't grow either. Oh. I was... At first, when it started, I was scared to tell my teacher because some of the plants died and I thought I did something wrong. But turns out I didn't. It was just how unhealthy some of the waters were. I found out that in Ottawa River, it was the dirtiest water out of all. Because the first time that I planted the plants, 
it didn't grow the first time. The second time I tried again and I tried replanting the plants, but I realized that it would only destroy the process. In conclusion, I will not be using any polluted water to water my plants. Thank you. All right, uh, another interesting project and uh, building off of the last one, uh, looking at different rivers, but then taking that water and watering the radish plants. And what was interesting is that she found the germination was actually poor amongst some of the plants. Um, now I'm a avid gardener and I start a lot of plants indoors and I have grow lights and then I take them outside and you know tomatoes and cabbage and all that stuff. And this year I had some species that didn't germinate well. And I think that's what she ran into is that some of the radishes didn't germinate well. And, uh, and then some that did start growing died. <laughs> so maybe from the polluted water. Now the Ottawa River coming through the University of Toledo campus is really pretty clean and it got undesignated as a bad water source. But I think, um, Connie and the kids were taking the water further down towards the mouth of the Ottawa, which is still considered fairly uh, polluted from, um, uh, there's a bunch of uh, landfills and then uh, the Ford, uh, not Ford, um, Jeep has their factory there where they make Jeep, Jeeps. Uh, anyway, so that, anyway, very, very interesting project. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say. I mean, the germination is just, really one of those issues. Oh, and again, they uh, she had to chop through ice to get to the water, <laughs> to get water to then use them um, water in your plants. Okay, if we, we can move on to the next presentation, um, unless there's a, um, other comments, and if you have comments, jump in. Do you see the slide? Yeah, so Natalie Jackson's next presentation, a sixth grader, and uh, do cloud shadows affect surface temperature on Earth? So it sounds very similar to a project done at Crutzwood. And Nectaria, um, who is the evaluator for Globe Mission Earth, she was here. She's a professor at West Virginia University. So we have other guests that have uh, been coming and going throughout the day. My name is Natalie Jackson. The title of my project is Do Cloud Shadows Affect Surface Temperature on Earth? Which is this. Okay, and then I have an thermometer, the thermometer, and it's this yellow thing, and you basically point it on the object you have. And my temperature is 31.8 degrees Celsius. And my, and my hypothesis is I think that when a cloud, when a cloud go over the surface and wherever it goes on, it's where the shadow is, it's it's cold, but where the, the shadows not is, it's warm. And my data is some days are sunny, some days are cold, which is eight, to eight days are sunny and seven days are cloudy. So I use the thermometer on air, surface, vehicle, grass, and walls. My conclusion is the clouds basically, the clouds cover, covers up the surface and my data supports my conclusion about the degrees and shadows degrees and shadows over the time of these past few weeks and thank you for watching my video have a great day
Okay, great. This is another great project and excellent research question uh, that Natalie had. And you know, this this question of uh, cloud shadows and temperature actually is one of the big climate change questions in the climate change model is how do clouds affect the temperature of the earth? And if we warm things up, if, if the humidity goes up, will there be more high clouds or low clouds? And how will that affect the temperature? So this is a very relevant and uh, kind of recent research question that she was tackling. And uh, you know, I found it interesting that the clouds uh, did cause a temperature um, decrease. And I think, you know, it, in general, it's probably because she's doing it during the day. Uh, clouds can have another impact. And um, I remember when my son was in kindergarten, we'd walk to school. And in the winter, I'd ask him, okay, is it going to be cold this morning or warm? And then basically using the cloud. So on a clear sky in the winter, in the morning, it can be very cold because the clear skies allow the radiation to go to space where the clouds act as a blanket and, and keep it warmer. But then when you see a, a sunny uh, or a, a, a summer day or even the afternoon in the spring or fall, the sun will warm up the earth. And so if it's clear skies, it'll be warmer. It tends to be than cloudy skies. So I think it's a really, really interesting research question that she had. Okay, so Taylor's our next presenter, an eighth grader. Does solar activity create space weather that can impact Earth? Ms. Taylor and my project is on Aurora Borealis, and one of the main question, uh, questions are, what gives auroras different colors? Well, below 60 miles, nitrogen molecules can glow pink or a bright purple color. And if they are above 120 miles, an oxygen atom will grow, glow a light orange or red. Ele electrons can shoot up into the upper atmosphere and cause color display. A couple of picture mixtures so you can tell this one is below 60 miles and this one is above 120 miles per hour this one also shows a mix of both which is very interesting and I honestly knew could never happen so yes my hypothesis was right you do not need a CME for an aurora borealis but when certain certain particles inject, you can cause an aurora borealis, which could cause a chain reaction across the whole earth. And my K index says, the index is used to characterize the magnitude of geonetic storms, specifically aurora borealis. The KP is an excellent indicator of the disturbances in the earth's magnetic field and is used by SWPC to decide whether geomatic storms alerts and aurora borealis. Oops and warnings that need to be issued for users who are affected by these disturbances. Aurora borealis cannot be harmful to humans nor animals. They are completely safe. And they have been associated with psychological changes in humans and some animals. I interviewed two Aurora physicists and I did my research from numerous apps for space weather. And we have discovered that Aurora borealis does affect Earth's weather and does not harm, cause harm to humans or animals. All right. Well, Taylor's project, um, as you may could tell, doesn't relate to GLOW. Now she, um, you know, I, I tried to advise her that she maybe should pick a different project to be related to GLOW, but she stuck to her guns. She's really interested in Aurora and doing this project. Um, and she did look at temperature, but of course it's temperature in the upper atmosphere away from where we take temperatures with uh, for GLOBE. Um, but she, she learned a lot about um, the aurora here and, and even uh, space plasma physics. 
uh, and I thought that was really commendable that she's interested in those things. I actually started out in space plasma physics at the University of Michigan for grad school, and I kind of decided I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to look at earth science more um, and look at the atmosphere, look at clouds and, and uh, climate models more than, than space, uh, aurora and space plasma physics. I did want to put in the chat, um, my colleague, uh, my office mate from University of Michigan, Claudia Alexander, she was a space plasma physicist and um, she worked at NASA and became the head of several um, missions. Um, and then uh, unfortunately she passed away in 2015 uh, from cancer, but I uh, just wanted to put uh, Claudia's information, you know, if you have a Wikipedia, Wikipedia page about you, you must be somebody important. And Claudia has a Wikipedia page. Um, so it's something for uh, Taylor to look at as inspiration for what she could do in the future. So we're altering the schedule because we are ahead and the next live presentations will be uh, closer to 145. So we're going to continue with Connie Atkinson's uh, students and I will call up the next slide. I guess it would help if I shared screen first. Okay, Calvin, can you read the title? Sure, okay, so Dylan uh, from eighth grade presenting which brand of bottled water most positively affects germination and growth of radishes. Hi, my name is Dylan, and I'm here to discuss my research project on Raphidistity fish and to see its effect on bottled water to see which one would be healthiest for Raphidistity fish. I chose specifically Raphidistity fish because that one would grow faster within the days I'm, I did the project. And uh, I chose four specific uh, main brands of water, and those I chose were Coral Hydration, Aquafina, Nesopure Life, Fiji, and Smart Water. I, I initially assumed that Nesopure Pure Life and Coral Hydrate would be the most efficient because they, my other classmates tested them and uh, they were the most healthiest, especially against Fiji because Fiji was like the least healthiest. So uh, when we did the results, I did the test, it was kind of surprising because the ones I assumed would be the most healthiest for it uh, germinated the seeds the least and the plants usually didn't grow out of the ones I specifically wanted to grow. But uh, the other ones, they actually grew for Fiji and Smart Water. And also Aquafina too. But uh, the sample was small, but more research to be done to determine if the data would stay the same. For this research, the data completely did not support my hypothesis. I learned the data for one type of water research does not always hold true for this type of project. So yes, uh, another student working on the radishes. And again, uh, Dylan had trouble with the seeds not germinating. And what was interesting is he had some types of bottled water where none of the seeds germinated at all. And then other, like the uh, Fiji, the seeds germinated pretty well. And what I remember from his uh, PowerPoint was that once the seeds did germinate, they all kind of grew the same. So the, the water didn't affect how they grew after they germinated. But it's an interesting uh, challenge. Like I said, I had the same problem this year with trying to germinate um, seeds. Uh, 
and I don't, I don't know. I do generally don't have that problem. I, I wonder, there could be a problem with the seed companies and where they're sourcing their seeds or something like that too, you know, how well they germinate. What's the main difference between the different brands of water? So in terms of the study? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I, you know, I know uh, Connie's students have looked at the different types of water over the many years. And I've learned from her students, like the Fiji water does have nitrates in it. And it comes from volcanic, um, a volcanic area. So it has more, say, nutrients in it than much of the other types of water, uh, more plain kind of distilled water kind of situations. I don't know why one type of water would cause the seeds to germinate where other types wouldn't. And in general, the students used many, they, they had replicates, right? They didn't just have one pot per water bottle. They had, uh, some of the students had like up to 10 uh, things of seeds for, for um, like one type of water. I, I think Dylan had that. And none of the like 10 pots germinated at all for, for the one type of water. That's different. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Um, like I said, though, I had something like that happen too. But now for me, it was more, um, you know, I had different, a certain type of seed. None of the seeds germinated. You know, the question is, did all his seeds come from the same pack or did he have different packs of seeds? So there's some other variables that might have played into it. Otherwise, it's a little disconcerting in terms of what we're drinking then. I <laughs> don't know why they're so much different. Well, that's why I'm suspecting the seeds because of my own experience and the fact that, you know, I spent a lot of money on these seeds. <laughs> it's, it would be easier just to go to the, the greenhouse and get the ones that are already growing and try to do my own. The idea of growing my own is it's cheaper, right? I can, you know, for two or three dollars buy a pack of seeds and grow 20 of the same plants. Uh, but I, I had some types of plants that no seeds germinated at all. I've never had to have I am a good experienced gardener, so I, I, I'm wondering. Okay, we have right. Elizabeth, and so we're going to be flexible here. And Elizabeth has logged in, and we're going to click uh, um, start with her presentation. So, um, here is her introduction. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have Friends Homeschool Next with teacher Steve Friends and the student Elizabeth Friends will be presenting on how humidity affects my running. Hello, I am Elizabeth Fran. The purpose of my project was to find out which days I would run faster when it's more humid or less humid out. I recently joined cross country when my pastor's wife came up to me and asked me if I wanted to join cross country because I placed third in my school's turkey trot, which is two miles around the school. So I reluctantly agreed because I don't really like running. And so, I went to a couple practices before school started and I fell in love. Um, so I thought it might be a good idea since science fair was coming up that I would link my running into my science fair. My hypothesis um, is that when the day is less humid out, I would run faster. And my question is, 
Which days would I run faster when it was more or less handed out? To prepare for my project, my cross country coach, Coach Rhodes, um, measured out one mile with me. And then I collaborated my Kestrel 4500 pocket weather tracker um, to make sure it works. And then I also step, set my stopwatch to make sure it also works. So then I took I take, took and recorded the data before I ran, then after I ran, I took and recorded the data after the run. In my results, my time were scattered. Some days, I, when it was humid up, I ran fast, but some days when it was not humid out, I also either ran fast or slow. In conclusion, the data that I collected does not support my hypothesis. When the humidity was lower, I ran my fastest time, but when the humidity was high, I did not run my slowest time. My observations show that there were a lot of sunny days and very few cloudy days. Um, throughout this experiment, I did start to improve in my running, but I did not think about that, although it did please my coach throughout. Um, if I would do this, this project again, I would do it during the summer months. I do intend to continue cross country in 8th grade. Hopefully I will be able to achieve a PR, which also means personal record. I think that if I were to do this again, I would choose a different location. I would like to thank my coach Rhodes for helping me measure out one mile for me and supporting me throughout all of my meets and running. I would also like to thank my parents and my brother for supporting me throughout my meets and throughout this project. Hopefully I've inspired you to go outside one day on a nice day and run a couple laps. It helps keep you healthy and stuff. I would also like to thank you for taking the time to come and or watch my, my report so you can judge it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I love this kind of applied weather study. It was real interesting. Your use of the scientific method, including hypothesis building and testing, was great. Um, I was glad to see that you checked your equipment, such as the weather tracker and the watch, to make sure they're working well before applying them. Um, you gave us really good insights into your study's limitation, including the time of the year and improved run time over uh, run speed over time. Uh, your post had some really nice uh, presentations of photos and graphs. And I did have a question is wondering whether you checked um, air temperature or dew point versus run speed. Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, yes, I did record um, air temperature and dew point for it's the things that make up humidity. Thank you. I would like to check. I see Victoria is also on. Um, are you, your, you and your students ready, Victoria? Thank you. Oh, yes. Thanks, Elizabeth. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Janet, would you like? Would you like me to introduce um, Victoria's uh, students in class? Uh, I'm, students I'm, I'm, in her. Yeah, I'm. I'm just confirming that she wants. Okay. Because this, if the students are there. Oh, I see a hello from uh, Vicky. Yes, I'm trying to unmute. There, no. Can you guys hear us? Yes. Yeah, there you go. We cannot hear you guys at all. Oh. Testing, testing. Oh. Hello, hello. Testing, test. Yes, we hear you. Oh, you can hear us. Could you guys say something just so we can see it? Because we're hearing absolutely nothing right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm. Nothing. Nothing. 
Should we leave and come back, do you guys think? Hmm. I felt like uh, with Zoom, sometimes I prefer to um, connect through the browser rather than through the software. Sometimes that works better. I found when I connect through the software, sometimes I don't get volume. And I just connect through the browser. Yeah, they can't hear us. That's weird, isn't it? That we can't hear you guys. Yes, it is weird, and we. Uh, I can't see that I can do anything. And so we'll oh. leave. We're gonna leave and come back if that's okay with everybody. No. Okay, we're gonna try that. And there go. Do we have another one that we could switch to, or should we wait wait for them to come back, Janet? Uh, we do have another one. I'm um, I have the wrong link um, for Cadence, and um, oh, here she's back. Let's see. We could, and two. We're lucky at uh, uh, Mitchell Clutt from Northern Michigan University has joined us. Very nice. We can't hear you. You're muted, Mitchell. I was working on my project. I had it all on my calendar, and I just lost track of time. I was just typing away. Yeah, well, good to have you. How about Vicky's class? Can you hear us now? I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. Yay. Oh, you can? can? Yeah. Can you hear us? I think when you took yeah. your mask off, it made you able to hear, I think. <laughs> well, good. I'll introduce them. Um, OK, hold on. Janet, OK. And I had the opportunity to, to meet with both of these young ladies recently when I went out to uh, Melvindale High School. And Melvindale is just outside of uh, Detroit, not far from Crestwood High School. And the students here have been working with uh, the Aaron Project and are learning more about GLOBE and are becoming a GLOBE school. And uh, I met with both Lydia Rapp and Alexis Feltner, and they both decided that they were going to work on a, a project that in the Aaron Project, uh, their teacher, Victoria Rock, Rock, but she rocks, Victoria Vach, uh has been really trying to be active in the GLOBE program and in the Aaron Project. And they, they tackled the topic of, uh, of a challenge that was sent out by the Aaron Project, which was, March comes in like a lion, but out like a lamb. And we've heard that statement before, and we just wondered if students thought that was true or not. Could they collect any data, have any thoughts about that statement? And so Lydia and Alexis uh, decided to, to collect some data and to comment. But uh, I, I do want to uh, compliment the school. This is the first time that we've had Melvindale High School uh, participate, participate in a GLOBE project. So we're really uh, happy to have them uh, involved in the GLOBE Project uh, family. And uh, so our thanks to Victoria and her students, Lydia and Alexis. And there they are. You can all wave hi to them. We'll wait for your presentation. It'll come up in a second. Okay. Are you going to present for them and then they'll just tell you, talk about the slides? Dave, oh, you're or? doing it live, aren't you? You're uh, yeah. Janet, that's right. They're doing the PowerPoint presentation or the PDF presentation. That's right. So we can share a screen if you want us to. Yes, we would love you to. Are you guys ready? We are ready. And then I'll share some comments afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Right. You guys know how to share a screen? You're good. Um, okay. Yeah. I think you got to click on the picture in there. Perfect. Just enlarge the screen, if you would, or hit the. Yeah, nice. Nice. Very nice.
Okay, we can hear you. Yeah, no sound. We're not getting your sound. Um, I think you're on mute still. Um, okay. Let me text to Vicki real quick. So the mute's in the lower left corner. We'll... Um, microphone looking thing. Oh, she's clicking on it, it says. Kevin, do you have any control of that as host? Can you unmute her? No, it says that we can ask to unmute, I'll, I'll click on that. But I don't know that that will do anything. Oh, she's unmuted now. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, oh, there you go. Oh, no. Victoria, you're unmuted. So can you talk here, see who can hear you? Issue. When there you go, we hear you now, Vicki. Uh, good. Issue is, when we hit share screen, it mutes us automatically. And it could be a default situation in our high school. But as soon as we hit share screen, let me show you again. Oh, now it's showing it's sharing, you guys. Can we just go over there? Can you guys see the presentation now? Oh, there you go. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Okay, you get the wrong button. All right, here we are. Let's try it again. <laughs> Sorry about that. You guys should be able to be heard now. You're good. Uh-oh, right, um, uh what just happened? Oh, it's because I'm trying to um, go back because I started to see You guys want to start oh, there you from go. the beginning? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So um, this is our Globe Observer. Um, it's by Lydia Rapp, Isidore Lucero, and Alexis Feltner. So the GLOBE process, when we were classifying our weather data for the month of March in Melbourne, Michigan, we were in the analyze and interpret data step of the GLOBE scientific process. We first went outside to look at clouds, and then we started asking questions, we started investigating, and now we are looking at the data we have collected. The question we wanted to explore, like they said, um, the question we were trying to study was in like a line, not like a lamb. We were looking to see if the weather at the beginning of the month was worse, more windy and colder, than the weather at the end of the month. The following slides show our findings. The data we were able to collect. So yeah, the image over there, um, number of days by cloud coverage, 0.25. An example of some data we were able to collect with Globe's help would be the pie chart to the left. It tells us the number of days of cloud coverage in March, which is when we collected this data. It lets us know that a good portion of the dates in March had 100% cloud coverage. This data can also give us more insight on the weather in March. There is not much sun in March in Michigan. More data. Um, we were also able to collect data on the temperature and the wind speed in March. When we looked at the data, we noticed that the wind speeds were spiked on the 6th and 12th. We also noticed that the temperature was not consistent the temperatures at the beginning of the month were cooler than at the end of the month. The wind speed were fairly strong due to the hot and cold temperatures. And here are those two graphs. Um, the temperature one, high temp, low temp, wind speed by day. And yeah, freezing while collecting data. Then there's Alexis and Lydia. Um, to collect data, we went out with the kites to absorb more of the atmosphere from up above. 
including things like temperature and pressure. While we were recording, we noticed that the temperature kept getting colder. So basically, we were hustling for warm suits that dipped in temperature towards the end of the month. In conclusion, um, we as students at Melvindale High School are very grateful for the opportunity that Globe Observer has provided for us. We plan to continue to use it to learn more about our surroundings. We, we will continue to learn and make a positive change in the world by noticing trends in climate, climate data. And that's it. Great, and thank you very much. Just hold on, and I'll share a few comments, and then maybe you could both uh, talk a little bit, share any of the thoughts that you might have. Um, one, as I mentioned before, really glad to have you join the GLOBE community and to start looking at GLOBE protocols and collecting data and using the tools that you have, um, that your teacher has uh, been able to make available for you to collect data and become more aware of your environment. Um, I like how you use the, uh, the GLOBE uh, process chart and learning how you go about uh, asking questions, solving a problem and so on. It's a, a nice tool to use. Um, I like that you uh, took the Aaron challenge to heart and actually tried to look at, at, at what is called, called an old tale that maybe it's true, it's like a farmer's almanac. Maybe these things are true, maybe they're not true, but it's interesting to collect data. And I'm sure Kevin as a meteorologist is probably thought about these things before. I'm glad that you looked at cloud coverage, wind speed, temperature, and um, but I particularly liked how you ended your presentation uh, saying that you wanna make a positive change in our world. And by collecting that data and thinking about those questions, you, you certainly do. Would you like to share a couple of thoughts about your work, your presentation? Okay, so, um... Yeah, it's been really fun to work on the Aaron project and stuff because we get to learn more about the weather, especially like in Melville, Michigan, and how that sort of weather data can impact um, more and more about what people can do in order to help climate change. So um, we're glad we were able to make like at least a, a small sort of difference and being able to help every step of the way. Wonderful. Would you like to uh, also make a comment? Alexis, I'm just talking to you. Um, I'm just glad we were given this opportunity. Enjoyed it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, with that, Janet, we'll turn it back to you. We really appreciate it. And thank, thanks for troubleshooting that, uh, Vicki and students there at Melvindale High School. Appreciate your patience on that. Thank you. Thanks for letting us come and do something new. So this was exciting. <laughs> try a new activity and be part of your of the globe project so we appreciate it yeah. wonderful and we want you back next year <laughs> hopefully these girls will come back then because i know lydia uh, lydia is not here lydia has covid so isadora has stepped in kindly for us today who also is in the same class with them and did participate in the project as well so uh Isadora is a junior, and Alexis and Lydia are both sophomores. So hopefully they'll continue. So thank well, you for the encouragement. Yes, please. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next, we're going back to Thurkel, um, and I'm, uh, here's the introduction slide. I think it's Kevin. Yeah, this is the, this one wasn't posted earlier, is that correct? It's on the GLOBE website and I actually got it um, called up. You, we can view the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, well, um, Zari Curry is looking at sunscreen. Which popular sunscreens effectively protect you from harmful UV rays? An eighth grader from Thurkle in Detroit. Okay. My problem is always getting to the stop share.
Nice that David Padgett has joined us as well, along with Mitchell Clay. Interesting, because that's not the one that I wanted to share. Do this again. We'll try one more time. because I do have it called up and I don't know why it's not sharing correctly. There we go, oh, it's third good. time. Mm -hmm. So I will just scroll through. Um, she did not submit a presentation, uh, a video. So uh, we do want to give her credit by looking at her slides. Now, Kevin, did you want to just read like a purpose oh, or? I could uh, shorten, I suppose. Here. So yes. using the UV beads to see uh, how the SPF, the different um, sunscreens help block this uh, UV rays. All right, and this is uh, kind of introduction again that they each uh, protect you different ways or you know different amounts. And then which uh, which one all SPF thirty which sunscreen protect provide the most protection. Okay, and. She ranked them by uh, value there. Zero, completely effective, one to five, minimally effective, and six or above, unsafe for use. And you can see how she had uh, eight circles there, made a chart. Nice pictures of what she did. You can see the different colors represent um, the, the impact from the UV rays. All right, so what did the data show? The controls, always good to see all 20. So all 20 of them change color. And then the varying uh, levels, and she did an average. You can see that banana had the lowest average. Avino and the other one what was the other one. Sorry. No, oh, Amazon. Okay. Amazon had the highest average. But I su suspect so banana would be the best protection and Amazon Avino would be the least protection. Okay. Oh, and she also had this level of efficiency on her table here. Yeah. Not quite sure. Well, that was, yeah, that's how she rated right. um, each bead, I believe. Oh. And then she counted up the beads that were effective or not effective. Okay, so we have a graph Kevin, showing that. Yes? Is, is the process, did they, did she just like rub the, the beads with the lotion? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then compare the cost as well. And then look at some discussion. Oh, she put the uh, ingredients down. That's that's good too. What's in them? And this percentage. Mm -hmm. Yep. The one thing we um, have encouraged in the past and. You know, 
Zaire area did not, um, wasn't a communication with me in particular, but uh, to try to link it to globe data and somehow maybe clouds or something like that, but she didn't do that here. Very nice. So when she submitted, it said that we'd have something with air temperature in it and um, that would link it to globe. Oh, okay. But I, um, I know we went through this fast. I didn't see anything. I, I didn't see it either. All right. Since I bought sunscreen yesterday. <laughs> was, Did you buy the right kind? <laughs> uh, I think it was, that wasn't represented there, it's the kind I did, but I could go into the percentages and see which one it was more like. Ekison. What's the prognosis of my water checkup? Which bottle or tap water should I be consumed by humans? A sixth grader from Wagger School. This is Connie's grandson. I think this is Gavin's brother. Gavin is a, a famous Globe participant who is now graduate high school, but he um, he's uh, his pictures on the Globe website in several locations when he was younger. My name is Kaden Sackison, and these are some of the tools I use. This is an IRT, and this is a Secchi tester. My grandma has been teaching her students about water ever since I can remember. She always dragged my older brothers around with her, and I had to stay home and wait to hear about what adventures they had. One time, the police followed them around because they didn't believe all they were after was a glass of water from some river in Toledo. I got to go that time, but I was asleep in my car seat, and I missed all the fun. For those of us who live in Michigan, water has been a hot topic for a while. I never really thought about things like this before. You just turned on the water and there it was. When the news came out about Flint and my grandma started talking to my dad about it, we started drinking bottled water instead. This year, I wanted to see what all the fuss was about and why we started drinking cases of water, bottled water at home all the time. The purpose of my project was to determine what kind of water was healthier for human consumption, bottle or or our local tap water. I found out my community gets its water from Detroit. Finally, I get to do it myself. We collect them from a few resident residences throughout the metro Detroit area that gets their water from Detroit. The residential samples came from Newport, Flat Rock, Riverview, and Detroit proper. The Detroit people were teachers who worked teachers who worked with my grandma. My hypothesis was that Bottled water would be healthier for drinking because they go through more purifying processes than tap water does, according to the market claims. All those extra tests should surely make it better to drink, right? The question seems simple to answer. Which type of water is healthier for humans to drink, bottled or tap? It really wasn't simple. I was really tired of doing all the te those tests on all those samples. I knew better than to ask my grandma if she would do them. She makes her students redo things until they hate her, but they are <laughs> glad when they get good grades. All the samples tested had problems. The Detroit samples tested positive for lead in several locations, including my house. Flat Rock was clear, but several others also had lead. Then I got to bottled water and was really scared. Ice Mountain is the worst ever. My samples tested 3 out of 10 for lead and 7 out of 10 high in copper. We poured out the rest of the case. No one in my house wanted to drink it after that. The Core Water and Nestle Pure Life were the best for drinking, according to my results. Only the Ice Mountain tested positive for lead. Ten trials were ran on five popular bottled water brands. Core, Fiji, Nestle Pure Life, Smart Water, and Ice Mountain. Five randomly chosen Detroit supply residential samples were also obtained throughout the area Detroit supplies. Communities selected were Detroit proper, Newport, Flat Rock, Novi, and Re Riverview. All samples were tested using the same equipment and were obtained from the same place. My results were alarming and my dad called our water department about the lead. They are not happy with him because now they have more work to do. 
We found out that the water place does not even test their water before they sell it to us, nor check how the builders installed the water lines. I do know that further investigation needs to be done about the tap water. I think people need to be aware of the many issues in both bottled and tap water. People should research before they buy and be responsible for their learning. I found out many things about both bottled and tap water. I see that even though I didn't did so many more samples than ever, it is not very many com compared to how many they produce. I want to write to the companies that produce this water and tell them what I found and make sure they check their water. She sounds like she's ready to keep those uh, bottled water companies accountable. Yes. That's a really good presentation. I think David uh, Bilowski reviewed it, but I don't see David here at the moment. Do, I do see we know it. Aldo? Oh, I'm here right he is. is. I'm right here, Ken. Sorry. And I hey. see Cindy has joined us. You were going to say, though? Oh, you were listed as Cadence, the um, reviewer of Cadence's project. Oh, I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I think it's interesting. You know, she remembers doing this with her older brothers, and um, you know, it was her chance. And she also understands her grandmother very well. I her, those are good insights. She has great presentation skills. She was very enthusiastic, lots of humor. Mm -hmm. Really nice job with that. Um, yes, yeah, so go back and, uh, and look at that as well to share some comments for her. Do we know how she measured uh, like the lead and the uh, copper and those kind of things? Uh, she did not describe uh, the instruments or test strips. Um, <laughs> the scientific equipment. And the more description, it is posted on our Globe Mission Earth webpage, and maybe there's more description in the, um, that we have there. Okay. Now we are um, moving to another school. Um, Kevin, would you like to read? Okay, so Janine Smith students from St. Peter's Junior High, Viviana Rucker, do urban and rural areas have snow with different pH levels? And I can't remember if Viviana is a seventh or eighth grader. She put seventh and eighth grade, but I think she's one of the two. <laughs> um, now, uh, Yes, Janine didn't um, say precisely in the registration. Oh, and Janine will be, the teacher will be presenting. For this project, um, the topic was investigating the pH of snow in rural, rural and urban areas. Um, throughout the school year this past year, we had a high amount of snow. And um, this project kind of came out of this student suggesting like, you know, uh, oh, yeah, so I learned about acid rain. Does that mean that there can be acid snow? And they're both precipitation. So she got kind of curious about it and then um, started doing some research on what pH is and then she just took off from there. She got very, very interested in what pH is and how important it is and um, got concerned and curious about whether or not we have acid rain or snow in our area, whether or not the, you know, the precipitation is healthy uh, where we live. And so she, um, this project was really all her doing 
all her idea, all her own research, all her own data collection. She was really extremely passionate about this project. Okay, um, her research question was, is there a difference in pH of urban and rural snow? Um, her hypothesis was yes, urban areas will be more acidic due to industrial pollution. And um, she followed GLOBE protocols for collecting snow samples and testing the pH. Uh, she collected five samples at each location on the same day at the same time. And her two locations were here at our school in downtown Mansfield and at a nature um, park about two miles away from uh, the school and a little bit more of a rural area. And then the park itself is, um, you know, rural and uninhabited by humans. Here is um, also a picture of her um, testing the pH of her samples in the class. And she, I don't know if you can see in the picture or not, but she's also um, videotaping herself while she's doing it. She recorded a lot of, um, of everything that she was doing so that she could go back and, um, and view her results. So she discovered that the snow in urban and rural Richland County was extremely close to neutral. And she was really surprised by this and extremely happy. Um, I was um, excited to see how um, happy she was that she, or almost relieved to get results that showed that we have a kind of, for lack of a better word, healthy rain and snow in our area that um, that isn't acidic or basic. Um, her so her hypothesis was correct though there was a slightly a lower um, pH value on average for the urban area, but it wasn't anything dangerous or anything that would cause someone to consider um, rain or snow acidic. And um, in order to see trends more clearly, she did discuss that it would be really fun to collect data for you know, a longer period of time or choose some more locations in Mansfield, maybe specifically choose locations near a steel mill industrial area in Mansfield versus an even more rural out in the country kind of area. Um, so she definitely is still cons uh, interested in this topic and I think may consider investigating some more um, so that she can find those trends that she was looking for or differences between the two um, types of um, the two areas were urban or rural to see if there was any difference in the snow. And she definitely considered um, testing the rain also when it isn't snowy and wintertime. So she did a great job on her project, presented at the symposium, shared with judges, and um, and at her poster all turned in and completed, and it, it looks great. Okay, well, thank you for looking at um, these projects, I hope that you enjoyed them and um, that they gave you some ideas for maybe doing some of your own investigation. Yeah, I got to go to the symposium as you saw my picture there. And uh, Viviana is actually interested in being a soil scientist. And I thought that was interesting. And I think she has also interest in ecology type things. So how soil relates to the plants and ecosystem. Where is this located again? In Mansfield, Ohio. So it's okay. kind of, well, okay. I think it's about two hours southeast of Toledo and okay. maybe an hour north of Columbus. Okay. It might be nice if she looked at like individual precipitation events and then looked at wind direction because sometimes depending on if the winds blowing from a source region of pollution it may vary. Okay, so Jana, are you going to present another one? 
So Gavin, Ian, and Connor's project. They were looking at aerosols and uh, close to water and away from water. Just to, yes, oh, just just to add, uh, Janine, these are three separate projects that Janine is talking about that three students did, but it was all related to this uh, research question. Yeah, these students are from a class, uh, basically it was a globe created class. So the, the fu function of the class was to have the students um, do globe projects and it was related, um, the seventh and eighth graders could join. Okay, um, this project is was on um, the relationship between aerosols in landlocked areas and aerosols near shorelines. And the students who did this project uh, were Ian Pitcher, Gavin Dodd and Connor Fournier, th three more students here. And um, they all did three individual uh, projects on the same topic. They did their research beforehand. Here is those three students at our local symposium. And here is their posters. Their research question was, is there a difference between landlocked aerosols and shoreline aerosols? Um, and their hypothesis was that yes, the shoreline they believed would have less aerosols than the landlocked areas. Uh, they used a, a website called Purple Air to collect the aerosol data um, from different sites. So they each had a landlocked site and a shoreline site. And the data was collected for seven consecutive days at the same time um, at each location. And they we had actually planned on collecting data from our own purple air device. We um, and our school is located in a very landlocked urban area and um, we could not get our purple air to connect to the wi-fi so although the kids were bummed that we couldn't take a look at our own aerosol data because of the all the purple air devices and all the data that's available on the purple air website they were able to choose um, different landlocked locations, um, somewhat near us in the same state that we live in, in Ohio, and then compare those to some shoreline locations along the shore of Lake Erie. One of those locations was actually uh, one of our Globe Partners um, houses. She has a purple air device at her house. Okay, so, and oh, and here she is in the pictures with uh, talking to the kids at the symposium. So the students' results were inconclusive again here. Um, they were very surprised that some of the shoreline's um, collection days had higher amounts of aerosols than the urban areas. They were just really convinced that um, the landlocked area was going to be um, more aerosols. Uh, but I think this had to do with they made an assumption that landlocked areas are just more urban than shoreline areas. And so um, we had conversations with them about how a shoreline area can be urban and can even be industrialized. And Sarah, who's in this picture, even sent the kids um, a map showing her area and showing how there is some industrial um, pollution, maybe possibilities near her her house. And then we also discussed afterwards that um, there might just be more wind. It might, it may have nothing to do with industrial aerosols and there may just be more wind near um, shoreline that would have contributed to the number of aerosols. Um, so for further investigation, um, these three boys said that, that maybe they would reframe the question, maybe look more at wind in the area or in, or consider urban versus um, rural instead of instead of assuming that landlocked meant urban and 
um, and shore alignment. Uh, but they also did really great, got their projects completed, presented at the symposium, um, and did a really good job with their presentations. Yeah, so again, the, the wind direction and speed were something that the students hadn't looked at, but it's a uh, you know, thing that, that would be good to look at in the future with all these projects. I put in the chat a link that actually shows a uh, over the United States, a climatology of particulate matter, then it shows like uh, clusters around the urban areas. And a lot of times those urban areas are in close proximity to the Great Lakes. So that, I think that might be useful to take a look at. That's interesting. So then these three students, Ava, Nigel, and Isabel looked at clouds and aerosols and how they're related or if they're related. Uh, hello, I'm Janine Smith. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to share a few of my students' projects. We had a science symposium, a local one recently, and although uh, my students are not available to share them, I um, still wanted to make sure that some information was available about them. Um, the first project was um, on investigating correlation between aerosols and cloud cover. And I had three students who did this um, same, who did a project on the same research question. These are those three students um, at their symposium, really excited to share their results. Basically their research question was, um, is there a relationship between the amount of aerosols and cloud cover? And their hypothesis was that the more clouds in the sky, the greater the number of aerosols that would be present on the traps that they made. <clears throat> they did some background research and learned how clouds form around aerosols and then uh, made this assumption that 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 those two things would have a correlation. Uh, you can see in the pictures here of their projects that they had some of their materials set out, some of their um, aerosol trap sheets and their magnifying glasses and dice that they use. These are some of the materials from the, um, the globe aerosol trap activity. They also did globe observer cloud observations and um, they did this for six days. They each of the three of them did it separately. So they had their own data and then um, they were able to compare each other's data when they were done. Here is a picture of um, one of them uh, collecting the data and cataloging how many aerosols they collected once they brought their aerosol traps back inside. So the students discovered that after six days of their findings were inconclusive. Um, we had a lot of discussions about what that meant and what we would have to do in order to um, see 
uh, more specific results, see more trends. And we discussed that, um, that they may need more time, more days, more locations, more traps, more collection um, in order to start to observe some trends. Um, they also had a really good discussion after they um, finished that um, that involved them considering uh, wind speed as an as a factor or a um, a variable that uh, is not controllable and therefore might be a variable that they want to take a look at as having some effect on the amount of aerosols um, that were in the air. Now the activity the students were using as part of GLOBE's um, up in the air activity where they have sticky paper and they do a grid on the sticky paper and then they roll a die and figure out which um, grid they're gonna count the particulate matter on the sticky paper well, you know, after they bring it in from outside. And I was just shocked at the amount of stuff on their sticky paper, <laughs> it was crazy. But again, they're in downtown Mansfield, actually, you know, quite urban, very few trees or vegetation and lots of traffic. So they're picking up a lot of like dust and things from the traffic. Did you know what kind of mechanism they were trying to explore and why the two would be related? Can you explain further, Mike? Um, so, for example, if you have more aerosols, that might be a, a cloud condensation nuclei that supports more cloud formation, or were they trying to argue that clouds might affect the aerosol concentration, or what were they, what was the approach? Or the, um, the I'm trying to remember what their original hypothesis was, because <clears throat> it was one of those two. Uh, I think it, I think it was the more clouds would have be um, produce more aerosols, and I, what I steered them towards was looking at the relationship versus cause and effect. Yeah, because I think it's very difficult to show a cause and effect from clouds and aerosols. Of course, yeah. you know you need cloudy condensation nuclei to form a cloud. Yeah, and there are situations where having more aerosols can lead to more clouds, but it, it's a difficult yeah. um, cause and effect to show. Yeah. I wonder if it's an area that if you were looking in an area that wasn't as urban where there was less aerosols, then maybe aerosols might have a more pronounced effect on cloud cover. But if it's like an area that's so abundant that it's not really a limiting factor. What I think is great about these presentations, it's two PhDs in atmospheric science can have a discussion, which is we're looking at. They're looking at good. <laughs> this questions. is good stuff. Yeah, very good stuff here. So if all three of you would like to make comments on um, what we saw this afternoon. Um, personally, I think it's awesome that the teachers and students work so hard to do some kind of research project and um, we're looking for ways to include more GLOBE data on the GLOBE website. Uh, Mike, maybe talk about the Globe Midwest Collaborative. Sure. Um, so yeah, we're all part of the Midwest Collaborative, which the goal is to try to build a, a stronger network among 
the partners in GLOBE, the schools, the teachers, the students throughout the Midwest states. Um, so each one of us represent that. Um, and so we uh, support each year um, these student research symposia that we've been having virtually so that we have an opportunity to share some of the great work that's being done. Um, every one of the presentations that was shown was excellent. It shows that the, the, the students indeed are um, citizen scientists. They're um, using GLOBE in an excellent way to really explore science and answer some of those key questions. So I, I found it was fascinating as usual, just like in past years, just the excellent work all around and um, raising questions that us as scientists are trying to explore using methods just like we do and producing end results just like we do. So it's very nice. Well, last words, Kevin? Yeah, well, well I wanted to thank everyone for presenting, uh, teachers and students. And um, I was just really inspired by all your hard work. And some of the students did mention how difficult it's been during a pandemic, you know, shutdowns, uh, you know, a student missing today because they're they're sick. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future things will get better, continue to get better, and then we can meet face to face at some point. I know Michael uh, is hoping to have a the Midwest symposium at the University of Wisconsin sometime at some time, <laughs> some year. I hope uh, so. That's, that's our plan. Yeah. Yeah, maybe next year will be the year, next spring. So uh, we're hoping for that. Yeah. And David. Janet, would you like to show the last slide, the thank you slide? I am showing thank you slide. Is that not like showing? Oh, no, I've got the, uh, oh, great job. Uh, the teachers and students slide, I'm sorry. The one yeah. after. Just one more slide to show. Yes. Am I, so on my screen, I see teachers and students no. in the middle. No. no, we still see great job. We don't see that. Oh, okay. Now that's interesting. You might have to reshare. Yeah, so we'll want to kind of give thank yous to the funding sources and to Dixon. Yeah, that's what I thought we were on. Uh, yeah, according we according to you. my um, PowerPoint here, that was the slide it's on. Let's reshare. I'll stop share and we'll. Do it again. Good. Okay, and we'll go full screen. Good and even. Good. Pretty close. That'll be good, but time to, to thank people as well. Uh, as you see, uh, NASA is a large contributor to the work that we do. Uh, in GLOBE, and we appreciate their work. And as uh, Mike talked about, the GLOBE Midwest Collaborative and uh, Mission Earth that uh, Janet and Kevin are involved in, which is a NASA-funded project, as well as the Aaron project that I'm involved in, and, in, and, and the work that's being done at the University of Wisconsin with, uh, with Mike. But in particular, we wanted to thank uh, Dixon Butler, at Y Lacey's, Youth Learning as Citizen Environmental Scientist. Uh, we have a little thank you gift for each teacher that was involved in uh, sharing their projects. One of the things that Y Lacey wants to do is to encourage teachers to collect more data and to have students ask questions and, um, and take on the role of, of scientists and to answer the questions uh, with solutions by collecting data about their environment. And Dixon Butler and Y Lacey's has been generous enough to provide um, a small gift for each teacher so that they're able to purchase uh, equipment for their classroom. And I'll be contacting each teacher after uh, our presentation to inform them how they can go about collecting and getting more GLOBE equipment for their schools based on the generosity of Y Lacey's and Dixon Butler. So thank you, Janet. And thank everyone that attended or will view this in the future. It will be put on our Globe Mission Earth uh, YouTube page, and I will be sending out links and we'll be posting the information. Thank you for all this to all the students who presented and their teachers that worked with these students. 
to do all this great work, all this uh, uh, observations. Uh, as when you have seen this video, it was just truly amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Um...